Gabe it to top of the arc. Here's Pip guarded by Gillespie. Steps back. Spins. Fires. Woo! Pip Gates. What's up and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Dish Sports. I'm Ben Vladi. I'm here with Matt Roscoe and Robbie Cannon. We've got a great show for you today. Guys, sports are back this week. How exciting is that? Couldn't be better. Could not be better. I'm fired up. Yeah, those words, they kind of just give me the chills. Mm, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I know... Matt and I are extremely excited. I mean, most of baseball fans have been waiting for this for a long time. Thursday and Friday are opening day for teams, officially opening day for the season. No more inter-squad games. No more fake scrimmages. It's real. Dr. Fauci's throwing off the first pitch to start it all. And uh, the season's going to be underway this Thursday. So that's kicking off the sports. Obviously, you know, golf and MLS have been back. But the real, not real, the, you know, core four American is – sports are coming back this week pretty or the upcoming weeks yeah opening day for baseball those are words that I thought that I might not hear this year just given the labor disputes and obviously the pandemic too I can't wait I mean I've just been you know I, I don't even know what I've been doing to try to fill the time but to have that back on you know got the socks going 60 game seasons better than nothing oh yeah for sure and I completely agree. I didn't know if it was going to happen. I, I was skeptical at first, uh, skeptical for a long time. S- still am a little skeptical until Thursday and Friday come. But, um, yeah, I couldn't be more excited. And I want to get – Matt, I don't know if you've been watching. And Robbie, I don't think you have, maybe for a little second. But these uh, inter-squad games or scrimmages like New York Mets, New York Yankees had it the past couple of days. I don't know if you've been watching, but – I really hope that's not an indication of how the actual season's going to go because those announcers on ESPN, in my opinion, not doing a great job. Yeah, so I was on, uh, I was watching a Red Sox live stream actually, and I don't even know who was the announcer was, but it was not Eck or, or Obi or any of those guys. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was tough to watch. And part of it too is because it's obviously an inner squad, you have a bunch of guys that, you know, hopefully you're not going to have to see play. Right. But I mean, it was just, it was tough to watch. Also, the camera angles. Mm. very weird they, different yeah yeah because you don't have as many camera operators there at right. least right now I don't know if they're going to change that for the season but the Red, the, I know the Red Sox live stream I watched one I watched one Red Sox live stream in her squad where and actually OB and Jerry Remy were the broadcasters and they did a pretty good job back and forth but I the camera angles I completely agree with that ESPN did have seemed to have a little more cameras when I watched it but the announcing I don't remember who was doing it. It was the same guys that did KBO baseball and stuff. But, I mean, their production just wasn't great. Like, I get it's a scrimmage and it doesn't matter. But still, I feel like you could throw the names up of the players, like with the batting average and all that. None of that. And it was like, you know, it's not just an inner squad. It's against two teams. I thought, you know, it be a trial run to see how it goes and try and get people excited again. But, I mean, I was excited because it's baseball. But I think the average fan would have been pretty bored. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I didn't even watch the whole game, their whole Red Sox game. You know, it would just go, boom, from behind the pitcher. Every time a ball got put in play, it just switched to a camera angle. It looked like, like the camera was above the press box, kind of looking down at the field. And those are the only two that I saw while I was watching. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, like you said, I mean, graphics, stuff like that, that, you don't even need to be in the stadium. The graphics teams aren't in the stadium on a normal for a normal game. So I'm sure that they'll they'll work out all the bugs and stuff like that and uh, the production quality. But even if it's bad, I'll be I know I'll be locked in just because oh, yeah. sports is back, baseball is back. Exactly, and I think you know they, it was on ESPN two. They're probably just taking it. You know, it's lazy. It doesn't really count for anything. So I'm sure when A Rod and the Sunday Night Baseball crew are back in action uh, over their live stream or however they're doing it, I'm sure production will be way up there. But yeah, Thursday can't come fast enough. Uh, we start off with the Nationals and Yankees. It was, World Series, not teams, but pitchers are going head-to-head, Garrett Cole versus Scherzer. So excitement right off the bat. Opening day, I think everyone's on a national broadcast for both uh, Thursday and Friday. And then, you know, we got NBA scrimmages happening and a bunch of other stuff that's happening all around the same time. So it's it's very exciting times. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just hoping uh, in terms of, as you guys are talking about the production of uh, the baseball games, I just hope I won't have to listen to Jessica Mendoza call any <laughs> games this season. Um, if, if I do, I'll be changing the channel to probably like the Food Network or something. But aside from that, I'm, uh, I'm actually excited, which for baseball, I don't like those two words don't really go with me in baseball unless I'm in the ballpark. Um, but I'm excited because I think the Sox are going to be pretty good. And um, I know that's co- contrary to what a lot of people think, but, you know, I, I like our stars, Xander, Raphael. I like our guys. I like my chances. I think that we can win games at 9-8. to It doesn't really matter. We'll put up the runs. We need the runs, that's for sure. Because offensively, one of the best lineups, I couldn't agree more. The guys are there, the, the young guys. There's not many young guys that are, you know, prospects, but the guys that we have are pretty promising. And, you know, the proven guys are there, J.D., Xander, Raphael, um, heck, even Mitch Moreland. And, uh, but, yeah, the pitching is pretty bad. So, if we do get wins, they're, they're going to be high-scoring games. I yeah. like that. However, however you're going to do it, whether you beat them one nothing or 9-8, it's still a win. So, I don't remember what year it was, if it was, like, 17 or 18. But whenever we had, like, the most walk-off wins and, like, half of them were with grand slams, I think we might see, like, that again. I remember – because I remember – I don't remember what year it was, but I remember Ness and they always had – it was, like, the team with Grand Slams. It was just a compilation of, like, all the Grand Slams Xander and everyone hit. So, I think we'll see that again if we're going to be a good team. Yeah, we'll score some runs. And, hey, maybe we can get creative 60-game season, get a couple guys out there, you know, short rest, whatever, every game matters. Oh, yeah. Get creative with that pitching staff. BJ looks like he's throwing the ball really well, which is yeah, huge. Brian Johnson's looking good. Um. You know, hopefully Eddie Eddie will be back soon. And, and you got Evaldi, who's coming off. I mean, if there's anybody who benefited from not playing half a season, it would be him. I mean, the guy is so injury plagued yeah. off all most of last year recovering from an injury. And then he just got this extra recovery time. Hopefully he'll be back and, and firing the ball. So we'll see what happens. I mean, the offense is there. The offense is, like you said, it's one of the best in baseball. You have Xander, you have, you have Devers. Um, and that's that's a core right there that, you know, we're going to be looking at for the next, hopefully, 10 years, 15 years. So Yeah, for sure. There are a lot of extensions to come unless, you know, maybe Mookie signing would limit those extensions. But otherwise, I think a lot of extensions the guy we have. And speaking of exciting players and exciting times, a very exciting team that we were just talking about off the air, the Toronto Blue Jays. They're a team littered with exciting guys that aren't proven, are proven. Um, you know, a lot of young talent like Kevin Biggio, uh, Bo Bichette, everyone loves Bo. Obviously, Vlad Guerrero Jr. is a powerhouse. Uh, they are not allowed to play in Canada right now. So the Toronto Blue Jays may not be the Toronto Blue Jays this season. So pretty interesting there because I know a lot of people were saying, well, you know, a third of the NHL is playing in Canada. Why can't one baseball team play there? And I th- I don't – honestly, I haven't looked into it that much. I think it's just a lot of protocol stuff. But I just think, you know, it's a pretty huge change, pretty big disadvantage for a, a team that could have been, you know, pretty good and still can be pretty good. But it's a big disadvantage, big surprise. The Toronto Blue Jays are not going to be playing in Toronto. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be brutal for a player. You know, you're used to road trips to an extent and staying in hotels, all that stuff. But home stands, when you're able to just go back, you know, you have that routine, you go to bed, you know what I mean, in your own bed. You go back to your own house. You're driving your own car. You're not on a bus or anything like that. You know what I mean? You're not on a shuttle to the stadium. Now, you know, these guys are all going to be living in a hotel. And I think, you know, I think a big part of it was with the way that NHL is doing it with the bubbles, the teams that are in Canada are staying in Canada. And I think the concern was having, one, teams from the U.S. coming into Canada, and two, having the Blue Jays, you know, traveling back into Canada after playing games in the U.S. So Canada, I guess Toronto doesn't want to have any part of that, any any – crossing of the border mm-hmm. um you know it'll be interesting i think it would have been a more of a disadvantage if fans were would have been allowed to be there For you sure. know but an empty stadium it'll be interesting to see how much of a difference you know not playing in the rogers center is how used to the rogers center these guys are and yeah. if they're going to be able to adjust that's, to playing in buffalo that's really where the home field advantage comes in because i mean obviously they're they're a turf field so I and mean, they've been playing game inter squad games or practicing on that for like you know, a little, like a half a month now. And then obviously other guys have been playing their, their, you know, most of their career. So that's a change. But uh, another change, and I know you're talking about protocols and in and out with teams. 
the Toronto Blue Jays were basically forcing their players that, you know, that the Rogers Center has that wicked cool hotel that has rooms looking right at the field. They're basically saying, you know, you can't, they were treating that as their bubble. And if players leave, they were getting fines worth of thousands and thousands of dollars. It was, you know, uh, I don't remember how much, but it was, it was over 25,000. It was more than that. So, I mean, that is now eliminated, I'm assuming, because, you know, they won't be in Toronto, but. So one of the options they're exploring is Buffalo, New York, and also Pittsburgh. The Pirates are, uh, you know, maybe, you know, they'll welcome in the Blue Jays just to share the stadium with them. I don't really know how that's going to work, but I think Buffalo, very interesting. Could be fun. There is a major league level stadium that was built for an expansion team there. Never ended up panning out. Uh, I've heard reports saying the field's, are up to date except for the lights the lights are like not led or something but the field dimensions and everything and uh you know quality is there so buffalo the toronto the buffalo blue jays could be a thing the first 60 games this year yeah correct me if i'm wrong but isn't that where their triple a team is in buffalo i think it might be it's either it's either the blue jays or the the mets because i know I think Noah Syndergaard was complaining about going there. I don't know if it was going to be a game there or if it was rehab, but there was a team that is in Buffalo. Yeah, a minor league team. Yeah, I think you're. I think it, I think it is the mess because I was just gonna say, you know, maybe it's a field that these guys are used to playing on because mm-hmm. there's so much homegrown talent. But I, I think you're right. I'm pretty sure it is the Mets. Yeah, but in terms of playing in Buffalo, I mean, obviously there's no fans, but if you can get fans excited, I think it's a perfect opportunity to, you know, sell some merch. You know, Buffalo Blue Jays. They have the same color scheme as the uh, Buffalo Bills already, so it works out there. Maybe some Buffalo Bills fans will come and watch some baseball just because it's coming <laughs> to Buffalo for a little bit. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. yeah it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens with, you know, how all this pans out. Oh, yeah, for sure. So that's, you know, like I said, Blue Jay is not going to be able to play in Toronto, but still a very promising team. And uh, speaking of plans changing – Roger Goodell and the NFL so far haven't issued a plan a plan for COVID and or training camp or anything. And players such as uh, Russell Wilson are kind of up in arms about it, a little confused about what's happening, maybe some concerns. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I saw I saw yesterday. Um, I guess a bunch of the players kind of came together and they all put out tweets hashtag We want to play with whatever is just saying the NFL needs to take it more serious. I mean. Right. Drew Brees, Russell Wilson, Mahomes, Todd Gurley, uh, Jarvis Landry. So big names. Um, JJ Watt, a bunch of them. So I don't I honestly I don't know what the what the NFL is not taking seriously. I think that they just still have time to announce their plans. Like I feel like the players have to be a little bit patient. Um I know the owners met today to to go over some plans, both on the health side and the financial side. So we'll see. Uh, I don't know when, when that will come out, whatever happened in that meeting. But, um, yeah, I mean, not the best leader for the NFL to have in Goodell, but um, who knows? I think I, I'm not that worried about the NFL. I think that those guys want to play so bad and, uh, and the owners will do anything, that, anything to, to get them out there. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, you start, you've started to already see teams issuing their own plans. So you have the Patriots, they'll have the stadium at 20% capacity. And there are a couple other teams that said that too. You have Philly saying no fans. Um, but, you know, th- they're planning on having a season. I think they will be able to have a season. Um, but yeah, Robbie, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they just have enough time where they can kind of read and react a little bit more than these other sports, whereas, you know, mid-season shutdowns or, you know, delaying the start of the season, the timing just fell right for football. They're going to be able to watch and learn from these the other three major sports, see what works, what doesn't work, and kind of create the best plan. If I'm an NFL player, I'm kind of happy about that. I'd rather have my league kind of draw from what these other three leagues are doing and, and put the best plan forward to have the, the closest thing to a normal season that they can. Yeah, definitely great points by both you guys. Couldn't agree more. Um, I think, in, although I think in terms of training camp, there might, there should probably be a couple plans floating out there already. Maybe there are, and the players just aren't aware of them. And, you know, it's all ownership and, uh, you know, behind the scenes guys taking care of that and just haven't come up with a final one. But I th- otherwise, I you know, you're completely right. Just watch and learn and see what happens. That I completely agree. They're lucky that their season was later and not affected in the beginning. 
Um, so, yeah, I'm not worried about the NFL right now until more news on, you know, COVID or other stuff comes out. But as of right now, I think, you know, full steam ahead, obviously the fans are a different story. But as terms of actual playing, I think if MLB, NHL, NBA can get it going in terms of the way that they're doing it, at some capacity there's going to be an NFL season. I mean, and it's already short enough. And I you know, and I know the actual, like, camps and stuff don't have plans, but, you know, they've been floating out things like the – the players are going to have the masks implemented into their helmets. They've where they're testing that in some areas, I think. So, I mean, they're they're thinking of things. Maybe not the most important things right away, but they're they're starting to think of little things. And like you said, and you and Robbie both said, Matt, uh, plenty of time to see how it goes and watch and learn. But yeah, so NFL, I'm confident it's going to happen. And, uh, yeah, so, Robbie, you know, you want to talk about a little bit of these NBA exhibition games going on? Those are happening pretty soon, huh? Yeah, they're coming up uh, this this week, next week. Um, but, so, I'm, the exhibition games are kind of, again, they're kind of, they're probably going to be a little bit like the inner squad games. It's not mm-hmm. much. Probably a lot of second units playing. Yeah. Um, really just guys getting back, getting in the speed of the game because – much different than from shooting around to uh to getting up and down and all that but um i'm excited the the real games start on the 30th i think thursday the 30th um but there's only two games at night and it's jazz pelicans and then the uh, two la teams so right. opening night we get uh donovan mitchell versus zion and then the, probably the two favorites for the title, the Clippers, Lakers. Right. Yeah. Um, Very exciting. So yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be a big time opening night, and then the next day, for everybody else plays the next day. Uh, so that fr- that Friday, oh, welcome back NBA basketball. Mm-hmm. Celtics box that Friday. Yeah, I know. Pri- yeah. Kind of a prime time too. They're like, I think they're at like six thirty or something. Yeah. So that that um, Thursday is definitely just uh a way to get the Clippers and Lakers on a stage almost by themselves. That's what I'm thinking right there. Yeah. Oh yeah. ESPN probably said, Hey, we, uh, we need Zion opening night and, uh, and LeBron. So right. there's that. I mean, I'm not complaining. No, not by me. <laughs> very exciting. And, you know, uh, very exciting guys, very entertaining teams to watch at competitive teams even. So yeah, it's going to be more but in terms of the inner squads though. I think, you know, obviously we talked about it with the baseball and our squads and the scrimmages that the broadcasts themselves weren't that exciting. But in terms of Twitter and Instagram content to watch, like I don't think I've ever had more fun watching highlights to see, you know, uh, Bo Bichette homer off a Toronto Blue Jays pitcher while he's a Toronto Blue Jay or just like the Red Sox guys taking each other deep and just the celebrations that the Red Sox – and other teams had not just Red Sox home run celebrations like Francisco Lindor was doing somersaults to home plate like that stuff you don't see when you're actually playing the games and it's just you know it, it showed personality and I know the NBA is already a big personality league and yeah. they got a lot of guys but I think these inner squads and stuff and exhibition games are going to really hopefully you know not taking as seriously but just go out there get you know get loose get back in the groove and hopefully show even more of the personality because that's what MLB was able to do. So I can't imagine how these NBA games are going to go like that. Yeah, I'd imagine they would. And like you said, these the NBA a lot of the NBA guys already kind of show show that a lot more than most athletes. Um, so yeah, I mean, and the the NBA is probably the most prevalent sport on uh, on social media. Mark, I listened to Mark Cuban one time talk about it, and essentially like they give all rights off to whoever to post whatever right. um, to just drive eyeballs. And so that stuff's all out there for, for a lot of the guys. So I, I'd expect in the, being in the bubble too, there's so much good content that's going to come oh, out yeah. of that, um, which the bubble, I will say the test came out today. Mm. Um, no negative tests in the last batch or no positive tests in the last batch. Um, so the bubble's working well, except everybody for tested. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I kind of, I kind of love that though. Like, give, give me some funny stories about it. Is the hotline. Funny. Yeah, it's come for awesome. a lot of funny, like fake storylines too. Like, someone's calling the hotline and they get the picture of Kawhi on a cell phone, like snitching on people, just saying that you know, oh, like Pat Bev got DoorDash. Like that stuff's funny. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, the bubble will be great content. Hopefully, they're not too 
hopefully they're staying safe but still getting great content in it. I'm excited. I know they talked about playing ping pong. I want to see some, you know, one one on one ping pong matches being played with these NBA guy, NBA guys. Yeah, no, it's actually kind of sick. I mean, just the Celtics alone. I haven't been. I've been kind of busy. I haven't been keeping up with too many of the other teams. Just like the real big guys, but like the Celtics. I mean, Gordon, uh, Tatum, Kemba, and Grant Williams. They played golf the other day, and then uh, Taco Fall, Marcus Smart, and uh, Cantor. They were playing volleyball. It's so like it, it's kind of it's just sick to like which Taco Fall in front of a volleyball net. Oh, really not fair. That's just not fair. <laughs> I was I was but, unbelievable. Just block city right there. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Um, but yeah, no, it is it is cool to see to see the other side of all these guys in the bubble. And they're legit, they're just like little kids out there. It's it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of good content to come with that. Um one thing that I, you know, really excited to see with all that too is just, you know, if it really does work, if they'll do more things like that kind of like maybe for like an all-star weekend and stuff, maybe if they'll go to like a bubble place and get, you know, content, not a bubble, like obviously not in an actual bubble right now, but maybe they'll go to like a same similar atmosphere and get like all these guys staying for the actual all-star week, all-star weekend, whatever it is, all staying together, all doing stuff together. If this works, I can see that happening. Yeah. I see what you're saying. I see other, other sports could do the mm-hmm. exact same thing if it, yeah. if it really does. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, speaking of other sports, obviously we're saying sports are back and it's all these major league sports, but there still are a lot of sports up in the air, including college sports. I know for one, a lot of smaller division two, three, and even some small division one programs out there have already canceled fall sports or said they're still not, you know, either canceling uh, non league or however non divisional, whatever non conference, excuse me, games. They've already canceled those and some just flat out canceling the whole season, whether it's soccer or lacrosse or anything. Um, obviously the major sports like basketball and we'll get to football are still up in the air, but yeah. So college sports are not definitely coming back. So. Yeah. I mean, it's tough right now, especially because all the, you know, for, from a college football perspective, you have all the players are all back on campus right now prepping like they're going to have a season, but they're in total lockdown mode. They're not allowed to leave campus. They're not allowed to, you know, really socialize with anybody outside of the team, uh, which I know has caused a lot of kind of resentment within college teams because these coaches are going home every night to their families. Right. But these guys can't go off campus to go hang out with somebody. So it's interesting from that perspective. And I was talking to uh, somebody who's high up uh, in one of the co- in a conference office who mentioned that, you know, he doesn't see there being uh, – uh, he doesn't see – foresee a, a college football season this fall. Like you mentioned, you know, there are already a couple of conferences have canceled all non-conference games. So I believe that's the – I believe it's the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, I think, are the two that canceled all non-conference games. I know the ACC canceled all games before September 1. Yeah. And the, um, the Big East canceled all non-conference basketball games, I think. Have they done that already? I don't know if they did that yet. I think – I know that the Big East canceled, like, all fall sports so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the Big East, A-10, they've canceled all fall sports. I think the Ivies – The Ivy League is out. Yeah, they yeah, – they're, like, out, out. <laughs> they're, 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 they're just, just like they were the first to cancel their tournament, they're the first to say sports aren't coming back. Yeah, and even the SEC, they've canceled all non-football fall sports already. So it, it's just turning in the wrong direction, especially because – you know, you talk about the schools that really need it are in a lot of the hotspots, the places where you right. really can't have, have big crowds. So Definitely. it'll be inter- interesting to see if kind of this desire for football motivates people to kind of take it more seriously or, you know, what happens. But from a selfish perspective, I wouldn't hate seeing a, a spring football season. I think that could be kind of fun. Spring you football would be a lot of fun. It'd be a you lot know, of fun. Start, sure. You start that in, in, uh, February, March, you might get some snow games in there, St. Patrick's Day games. Yeah. Um I'd mind that. Although don't don't conflict with March Madness for me. <laughs> That's the thing. But think about think about how fun that would be from a fan's perspective. You go to a college you go to your college's football game, you go home and then you just have, you know, however many games, sixteen yeah. basketball games on to watch. Yeah. So kind I kind of like know, a homecoming type high school atmosphere where you go from one game to the next. Exactly. Exactly. I and yeah, again, selfishly, especially being at a school in Boston, 
you know, having a game marathon Monday weekend would be, you know, just unbelievable. So, and I think too, that would give us a better chance at a normal season. That would give us a better chance to be able to go to these games. Like if there's a season right now, there's not, there aren't going to be fans in a college stadium. That's just. Right. And that's, that's where all the revenues driven for these teams pretty much. I mean, obviously the big teams get the TV deals and all that, but for the most part, it's the fans coming, especially at, you know, schools out there that don't get a lot of things, a lot of attractions. I mean, uh, I know Robbie, me and you and I, we, uh, we went to a talk with our Dean and uh, athletic director and they were saying, you know, our, we obviously PC, Providence college doesn't have football, but our basketball team is the sole uh, revenue for every single sports, even hockey, our second biggest sport basketball drives all of that. So you can only take that and imagine what football does for these other schools. Yeah, it's, you know, football is, that's the breadbasket for everybody. And, you know, yeah, especially, and you made an interesting point about the revenue. I think that that's going to affect the G5 schools more than the Power 5 schools, just because, you know, from a G5, yeah, you don't have these massive TV deals. Whereas, you know, even a school like Boston College, by no means, I mean, I shouldn't say by no means a major football program, but not a school that you're used to seeing on a national level within right. the last 10 years or so. You know, we're still, all our money's from TV. We lose money with game day production. That's just kind of the way it is. You break even on a, you know, at best with ticket sales. Um, it's all advertising. It's all TV revenue driven, conference revenue driven, revenue sharing within the conferences. Um, you know, if you don't have a fall football season, that puts a lot of winter sports in jeopardy too where, you know, you, you don't get the funds that you need to put on, you know, vo vo well, volleyball is a fall sport, but you know what I mean. You know, right. with basketball, you know, yeah, for no, most for schools, sure. a huge revenue driver. You need that football revenue to get your, your women's basketball up and running. So it'll be interesting. And the president of the NCAA, I don't have it right in front of me, um, his exact quote, but he said something where, you know, the data is trending in the wrong direction right now mm -hmm. for season yeah. So yeah him and you know I was supposed to have an interview with Boston College's new AD and all that's gotten pushed back because of the uncertainty uh regarding you know what's going to happen in the fall it's mm -hmm. it's not looking good right now no, yeah I, I mean we'll go ahead Ross. It's, yeah it's pretty much I mean it's, it's it's not a secret that there's two um two college sports that are profitable and the rest are in the negatives, the rest are funded by these two in basketball and football. Mm -hmm. With football, especially uh, down south, it's just boring, boring and Our more house. money than than they know what to do with. But um, I don't know. We'll see. I think I, obviously the data, the trends right now, are, uh, we're going in the wrong direction, like you just said, Matt. Um, we'll see. I mean, the, there has been some vaccine hopes, so we'll see. Um, but obviously you can't, we'll see, we'll see if, if we even get it, does it money talks, can these schools pay for them? We'll see. Cause I, it wouldn't be the best look if, uh, there's people who actually need them while we're giving them to athletes so we can put them out on the field, you know? Yeah. And um, athletes that, you know, these guys aren't paid either. So that's another thing right there. And then not to cut you off or anything, but to circle back and, you know, you talked about a lot of the. Uh, um, like you said, your football guys are all quarantining or staying put on campus while the coaches are going home to their families. And a lot of other places, like I know in Boston College, the Red Sox are using it as a sort of like another camp for them. So there's not, it's not like proud in uh, Boston College, excuse me, is it's just closed. There's people going in and out. So, I mean, the, these football players are in other, in Boston College and other schools aren't just like, they're not completely isolated. There's people going in and out of the school. So it doesn't really make that much of a difference there. That's just the point I just thought of right now. And uh, yeah, it just makes me think the the best bet for college football is in the spring. Yeah. At this point, you know, selfishly, I want to be able to travel to, to call some games and that kind of stuff. And that, you know, we talked to our guy and he said, look, that's not going to happen if we have a fall season. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping for, for a spring season and get it as close to the normal schedule. I mean, we were supposed to have seven home games. Cut non-conference, we're down to four home games. You know, no tailgating, no fans in the stadium. It's just, I think, 
it would be in the best in maybe not even the best interest of the school, but in the best interest of the fans to have a spring season, it's going to be your mm-hmm. best shot. And, and even then, it's no guarantee that it's going to be normal, but that's your best shot. No, for sure. So I'm I, think, normalcy. I think the spring for sure is the, without a question, the the most comfortable time for fans to return. And looking at the positive side, I know obviously, you know, having no football in the fall or other sports in the fall is a big negative for the schools, but positively for fans' perspective, you're going to get to see uh, NFL season in the fall and winter, and then college football just comes around and takes it over again. So it's like football never stops right there. A lot of people that normally wouldn't be atten- uh, paying attention to college football are going to start paying attention to it. If there's a spring season and fans are allowed to come back, that you know, it, there's a possibility that m- even more money could be generated because more people are watching those games. I mean, there's a chance if it's in the spring, more people are going to be watching college football than – you know, golf, baseball, anything that's really going on. Because, I mean, college football is already a huge, huge, like, cult following, and not even cult. Like, everyone loves college football. So just if it's in the spring, it could be the main thing of everyone's focused and really, really get that money going and just be a great experience overall. Yeah, 100%. And from an atmosphere perspective, I can't imagine, you know, it's going to be the first, say you push it to January, and or February and that's when your your spring season starts right around the you know a couple of weeks into spring semester say two weeks everybody gets quarantined and then you go that mm-hmm. first football game the first time that the student population is able to get together as a whole I mean college football has an unbelievable atmosphere as it is but that atmosphere would just be absolutely insane snow games first time everybody's back together again I mean, it could just be – it could be unbelievable if, if it pans out that way. But, you know, long way away. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But, yeah, right now, I, I would not be betting on having college football this fall. No, but looking forward to when it does come back and extremely looking forward to the upcoming days where baseball, NHL, NBA all come back pretty much within the next couple of days. So – Extremely exciting. Um, I know we've, we've probably already mentioned it, but just real quick, what's the most exciting – what's the thing you're looking forward to the most in the upcoming week or upcoming two weeks? Can be any sport. Pat, you go first. I can't wait. Friday night, Red Sox, first pitch. I'm going to be locked in. Uh, I'm actually going to be up in Mass, so I'm going to be on somewhere where I can watch that game and just just to watch – a live sport that I care about again. Yeah, maybe you can go down to Jersey Street. I think they're doing that, right? They're doing that. You can watch the game and, you know, maybe have a beer. Two of Matt's 21, of course. Yeah. Yep. So, could do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I But, yeah, just that first pitch, just to have a, a real sport mm-hmm. back that I can watch that I care about. That first live action since, what, March? early March, it's, it's just going to be unbelievable. Yeah, I would say for me, it's pretty easy. Celtics, I, I mean, I really have. I've heard a lot of good things. It's probably because all the accounts I follow are like Celtics <laughs> accounts. So, But, I mean, I've heard I've heard a lot of good things. The guys look good. The second unit I heard looks really good. So, we'll see. I'm excited. I hope we make a deep run. Ben, what do you got? I bet it's going to be pretty similar to what Matt just said. Yeah, I think you you got it right there. I think you're spot on. It. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that Red Sox first pitch. I mean, just baseball first pitch in general. But, I mean, Red Sox, there's so much so much that could happen. And I think that first game we see, if it goes well, my, I know my hopes for the team are going to skyrocket. Because if Nathan Avaldi can come back from not throwing for an extreme long time and just shove, like, do it come on the Sox got it <laughs> but uh yeah no just baseball in general and I'm really I'm gonna be I'm normally not a huge NBA watcher I'm gonna be watching all those games I mean every every sport that comes back is gonna be so exciting but yeah I'm, I'm ready for Red Sox first pitch just I mean, everything that's happened all the labor stuff and salary stuff that's was just dragging all this out it's just going to be good to see a real baseball game being played. So that's what I'm looking forward to the most. But anything else you guys got to touch on? I, I think we hit most of it. I don't think so. I mean, the only other thing, hockey's coming back. So, I mean, yeah. just one more thing. And not that that's that's probably all like second or third on our plates is Bruins. But, hey, 
If they make a run, I'll be tuned in. Oh, yeah, um, make a run. They're going to be nasty. Yeah. I know. They will be. They're the, they're the betting favorites right now, I think. So, we'll see what happens. Oh, yeah. All right. That's uh, that's all we got. So, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. We'll we'll be back at you with a lot more sports happening next week. This week's going to be crazy with sports. So exciting. So, thank you all for watching. This is Behind the Dish Sports. I'm Ben Blotti with Robbie Cannon and Matt Marasco. We'll see you guys next time.